Let's wait for it to start to record now. There we go. Okay. All right. So let me, uh, I'm going to try to knock out this chapter pretty quick. We're, I'm kind of behind everybody else who's teaching government. So um, chapters five, six, and seven are all going to be dealing specifically with the three branches of government, all right? So starting with, and this is usually kind of like we're kind of going and kind of order how they appear uh, in the uh, in the Constitution here. So uh, chapter five is dealing strictly with the legislative branch, right? And when uh, we talked, I think it was like chapter two, we we're just kind of talking about some certain aspects of the Constitution there and talking about how each branch of government is a kind of, has a specific role and duty, all right? And so we had talked about when it pertains to laws, right? Because the Constitution is, you know, it's basically the legal code, if you will, of the United States. So the thing that you need to know, not just for the test, but this is definitely a question on the, on the, on the Constitution, uh, let, with the job of the legislative branch when it comes to laws is that they make laws, right? They're the ones who, who kind of create the laws uh, that are later either signed or vetoed. And we'll talk about that when we get to the executive branch. We talked a little bit about this, how our, and collectively, uh, we kind of refer to our legislative branch as, as Congress. Congress is what we call basically a bicameral legislature. Bicameral meaning two houses. Uh, and so we had talked about how like this kind of tradition comes out of the kind of British tradition where the parliament there has the House of Lords and House of Commons. Right? Uh, essentially Congress, like I said there, is made up of the Senate and the House of Representatives. This is stuff that's real. So you guys had this pretty, pretty. I mean, when you're in seventh grade or whatever, so it's pretty easy, all right. Um, and specifically, we'll talk specific, like the specific jobs and responsibilities of each of these houses, all right. Oftentimes, we refer to the Senate as the upper house and the House of Representatives as the lower house, all right. So, just this past election here. <clears throat> we had a third of the senators are up for re-election, and then all the members of the House of Representatives are up for re-election. We'll talk about their kind of terms and such like that. All right. Uh, there's a nice picture there of, of Congress, right? Capitol Hill right there, uh, the rotunda. Uh, I'm going to play a short little video that's going to talk about kind of like the, uh, just some introductory kind of basic information here in the uh, illustrative means. There are three branches of government in the U.S. Legislative executive and The legislative branch is comprised of the United States Congress, the bicameral legislature responsible for writing and passing all federal laws, among various other functions. Back when the founding fathers drafted the Constitution, debate stirred over the type of legislature they'd have, one with equal representation, i.e. the same number of representatives for each state, or a proportional representation, in which the number of representatives reflected the size of each state's population. Unable to choose, they settled on both. A legislative branch with two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate, which together formed the Congress. This was all outlined in Article I of the Constitution, which also notes the functions, powers, and parameters of the Congress and its individual representatives. A congressman's primary responsibilities include representing the interests of the constituents, working together to write laws, overseeing other government agencies, and passing bills. But of course, that's all way easier said than done. To understand how it all works, we have to take a closer look at the makeup of the two distinct houses. The first and lower house is the House of Representatives, made up of 435 elected officials. Each state has allotted a number of congressmen, determined by their total population. To become a member of the House, one must be at least 25, have lived in the U.S. for seven years, live in the state they will represent, and be elected by the people. Congressmen serve two-year terms, and they're up for re-election every even year. The House is led by the Speaker of the House, who's elected by the House of Representatives. The House has a few exclusive powers not shared by the Senate. Only the House can initiate tax laws and spending bills. Only the House can initiate impeachment of the president or other government officials. And in the event that there's no majority in the Electoral College for one of the presidential candidates, it's the House who casts the deciding vote. The Senate, or the upper house, is made up of only 100 elected members, with two senators from each state. 
Here, a state like Wyoming has as strong a voice as California, even though California has a much larger population. To run for Senate, one must be at least 30 years old, have lived in the U.S. for nine years, and live in the state that they will represent. Senators serve six-year terms. Every even year, a third of the Senate is up for re-election. Before the 17th Amendment was ratified in 1912, senators were elected by the state legislatures, but now they're elected by us, the people. The Vice President of the United States serves as the head of the Senate, but he or she may only cast a vote in the event of a tie. The Senate exclusively has the power to approve presidential appointments and treaties. And when the House moves to impeach a government official, it's the Senate that tries them. Together, both houses have the power to tax, coin money, declare war, and regulate foreign and interstate commerce. But Congress's bread and butter is writing and passing bills. Getting a bill passed is no easy task. A bill can originate in either the House or the Senate. But before it gets voted upon, it goes through a series of committees and amendments and floor debates. After a vote, it moves to the other chamber and the process continues. If the one chamber makes any edits to a bill passed by the other, it has to go back for another vote. The House and Senate must vote to approve the exact same bill before it can move on. If it fails to get a majority vote, it has to be reintroduced. If it passes, it goes to the president's desk for approval. If the president chooses to veto a bill, which essentially voids it, Congress can push back the veto override. But to do this, they need a two-thirds majority vote in both houses. Failing to pass legislation is an inevitable part of congressional routine. Congress is the only branch of government whose members are elected directly by the people, and the only part of government that tries to balance the relationship between the power of the nation and the individual states. To see how the Supreme Court checks the president, check out our video. All right, so like it says there, here, we'll kind of break it down by, by each house there. So the lower house, as they refer to as the House of Representatives. So we had talked about this when we were talking about the kind of the makeup and the kind of uh, the, the kind of Constitutional Convention. Uh, this is based on what they kind of based on kind of like uh, proportional representation, right? Based on state population. So each state is guaranteed at least one representative. However, if your state is like California, you have more representatives, like I said, than, than Wyoming. Uh, there's a few states that only have one representative based on the fact that their population is, is relatively small. So um, uh, now the kind of, uh, House of Representatives, the number is set at 435. All right. So uh, this is the kind of the significance here of the, the census we had talked about. That people have been getting stuff in the mail, you probably should you know, fairly have a problem to send back. All right. Um, what occurs here is after 10 years, then things are kind of kind of reevaluated. All right. Um, so California, like I said, has the most representatives, about 53. Uh, they have been kind of gaining representatives probably since we're talking about the 70s here. Uh, probably like a, like a couple representatives each kind of census. Seven states with only one representative based on the fact that they're small populations. That's Alaska, Delaware, Vermont, North and South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming. These are states that actually have more senators than they do representatives. All right. So um, again, this is kind of shifting. You have, like we talked about, like states like California and the Sun Belt, Arizona, Texas, Florida, traditionally have been gaining um, representatives every 10 years or so. States like Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, what they call the Rust Belt states. Uh, have been losing. And so after this, kind of after the census in 2020, we'll probably lose another representative here uh, on the fact that the population of Illinois is shifting a bit. So um, this is also where it kind of like plays into like the last election here. Uh, your electors is based on the fact how many representatives you have and how many senators are in each state. All right, so certain states like, you know, like Florida play a big role uh, Pennsylvania obviously played a big role because of the, the numbers and the teams. And then some of the smaller states, uh, like Wyoming and that, you don't know, usually see the presidents kind of going there. Uh, like I said, we'll probably, this is from 2010, 2020, Illinois right now is at 18. We'll probably go down to 17, right? And as a result here, a lot of times with this, you're going to have these, um, the state legislatures, one of these states are going to have to redraw what they call redistricting in many cases. Uh, and there's somewhat of a controversial concept here with the idea of kind of redistricting uh, kind of, uh, kind of a congressional district here called gerrymandering. 
right? Uh, this is generally done by the fact that these district lines are done by state legislatures, right? And uh, usually if the state legislature is dominated by, dominated by one political party or another one, they will try to gain an advantage, right? It is uh, kind of something that's uh, been around since the 1800s, right? Uh, have you ever heard this term gerrymandering from the Western News? Again, it's somewhat like it's somewhat controversial in that sense, but it's just kind of kind of, and it's a kind of a made up word here. I'm going to show you this video that kind of talks about this. Um, it's something though that's kind of unfortunately kind of baked into the, uh, into the system. Most people have heard the word gerrymandering once or twice, probably during a presidential election. What exactly is gerrymandering? Essentially, it's the process of giving one political party an advantage over another political party by redrawing district lines. It's like Democrats trying to gain an advantage over Republicans or Republicans trying to gain an advantage over Democrats. You see, each party wants to gain as many districts as possible so they can do things like control the state budget or set themselves up to win even more districts in the future. So, to understand how this process began and how it continues today, we must go back to 1812 in Massachusetts. Elbridge Gerry, the governor of Massachusetts, supported and signed a bill to allow redistricting, that is, redrawing the boundaries that separate districts. The catch? The new lines would favor Gerry's own political party, the Democratic Republican Party, which no longer exists. You see, Jerry wanted his party to win as many state Senate seats as possible. The more members of your party who vote, the more likely you are to win an election. The new lines were drawn to include loads of areas that would help Governor Jerry in the future. They were so strange looking that someone said the new districts look like a salamander. The Boston Gazette added Jerry's name to the word salamander and voila, gerrymandering, the process of dividing up and redrawing districts to give your political party an advantage. So how exactly does someone go about protecting their own political party and actually gerrymandering a district? There are two successful practices, packing a district and cracking a district. Packing is the process of drawing district lines and packing in your opponents like cattle into as few districts as possible. If more districts equals more votes, the fewer the districts there are, the fewer votes the opposition party will get. Packing then decreases the opponent's voter strength and influence. Cracking is the opposite, taking one district and cracking it into several pieces. This is usually done in districts where your opponent has many supporters. Cracking spreads these supporters out among many districts, denying your opponent a lot of votes. When you have a large number of people who would generally vote for one type of party, those folks are known as a voting bloc. Cracking is a way to break that all up. So when would a party choose to pack their opponent's districts rather than crack them? Well, that really depends on what the party needs. To dilute your opponent's voters, you could pack them into one district and leave the surrounding districts filled with voters of your own party. Or, if you and your party are in power when it's time to redraw district lines, you could redraw districts and crack up a powerful district and spread your opponent's voters out across several neighboring districts. So, Governor Jerry in 1812 wanted to gain an advantage for his party and redrew district lines in his state in such a crazy way we have a whole new word and way of thinking about how political parties can gain advantages over their opponents. Politicians think of creative ways to draw districts every few years. So the next time an election comes around and politicians ask people to vote, be sure to look up the shape of your district and the districts that surround it. How wide does your district stretch across your state? Are all the districts in your state relatively the same shape? How many other districts does your district touch? But always be sure to ask yourself, does my district look like a salamander? So um, this is the, kind of the, the cartoon from which this, uh, this name was drawn from uh, in this kind of district that was kind of re uh, created uh, in northern Massachusetts. Right? And so as time, the, kind of the name has just kind of stuck here. So um, a few years ago, there was a famous district uh, in, uh, in the debate in North Carolina, the Congressional's Wealth District. That was kind of a strange looking district here that basically was that kind of example of packing. It essentially kind of basically put all kind of, uh, kind of the uh, large African American uh, population into basically one district. This was drawn up by the uh, by the state legislature of North Carolina. Uh, a few years ago, 
they actually kind of uh, determined that the state, the state uh, uh, Supreme Court there determined that this was essentially unconstitutional, all right, and so they broke this up, all right, to giving kind of African Americans a little bit more than just one uh, major uh, uh, kind of district here. Similar thing happened up in, in Illinois here with uh, the Congressional 4th District. This is up by Chicago here. They call this earmuffs because the district is in this kind of, kind of the kind of northern southern kind of party kind of wraps around. This is was an attempt at the time when the Republicans were controlling the state legislature to basically pack the a large Hispanic vote in just into one district here. All right, uh, and so uh, that's like in Illinois, that's kind of a prime example of that one. And then here down, like kind of here, if you live in like if we you know depending on where you live. If you live like in like kind of like Caseyville in this area, uh, in like for example, this is my district, the Congressional 12th, which kind of stretches kind of like all the way from all all the way down to kind of Southern Illinois, Carbondale included there. Um, this is uh, the uh, this the the congressman there that uh, represents as my boss, and then uh, this is the 13th, which the majority of people, if you live in Collinsville, the majority of people are part of the 13th district. This is Ryan Davis's district. This kind of stretches up uh, kind of, uh, through Champaign in that area. And then there's a small section of 15 where there's a little sliver within Collinsville that kind of basically covers all the way kind of to, to eastern Illinois. So the southern part of the state has a lot. And there's like if you're a congressman from this area, you cover a lot of ground. A little bit further north of Chicago, where there's kind of the population centers a little bit more compact and tight and stuff like that, um, your, your district isn't as large, if you will. All right, this is the district that is represented by John Shipkiss, all right? But so in Collinsville here, in this area, you go to, you know, depending on where you live, you could be part of one of three, uh, one three congressional districts. What will probably happen after the, the census of 2020 is one of these districts will basically be, basically, they'll we'll combine two of these districts into one, all right? And so what will end up happening is that, that essentially they'll probably be, uh, like, you know, Davis and Shipkiss will probably be running against each other. Uh, simple stuff here that you guys probably covered when you were in grades or uh, in, in middle school. Uh, qualifications need to be a member of the House of Representatives. You must be at least 25 years old. Matter of fact, I think there was a guy actually in North Carolina that just got elected and just turned 20, 25. All right, he'll be the youngest member of uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, you got to be a citizen for at least seven years. All right, you must be a legal resident of the state that you represent. All right, so that's the kind of the, the qualifications to be right. That's that's you have to just have to meet those qualifications. Here. All right, um, and it gets a little confusing because while we call Congress both the House of Representatives and the Senate, usually people who are referred to as congressmen are basically representatives. It's just been kind of tradition here. It's just that they do when, when they refer to them, they don't usually refer to senators as congressmen. That's strictly for members of the House of Representatives. All right, um, in terms of office, you're elected. Uh, it's every two years, basically. Elections for members of the House of Representatives, like we just had the election November 3rd, all members of the House of Representatives were up for re-election. So they serve two-year terms, and it's almost in this day and age, you're almost like, even after you're elected, you're almost just like immediately going back into re-election mode. All right. Um, now, if a representative dies or resigns before the two years, the governor can call a special election. Of the, of the state to uh, to appoint somebody. Sometimes some states allow for them to kind of appoint people, but a special election has to be called. All right. Um, like I, when I was in high school, the representative for our district at the time, a guy named Melvin Price, has, had passed away. Uh, and our history teacher's son was actually his chief of staff. So um, so he um, he basically filled in that position for a little bit, uh, and then they had a special election. I think mean, Jerry Costello became uh, became the representative then. Uh, some of these guys are served for a long, long time. Like Melvin Price, remember he was like in his, I think he was close to 90 uh, when he uh, when he passed away. So a lot of these guys are going to be here for, for a while here. Uh, there are no term limits for members of Congress, right? And that's something that has been kind of like mentioned in the past of you know, trying to kind of make a little bit government a little bit more uh, kind of maybe younger, comprehensive there. The Senate basically is based on equal representation. That was from the New Jersey plan that we talked about. The kind of House of Representatives came uh, directly from the Virginia plan. All in all, there's 100 members you should know. That's basically two times 50. Right. Uh, their term of office is for six years. Right. And so while all members of the House of Representatives are up for re-election every two years, for Senate, it's a third of them. 
Uh, the likelihood of 435 people being voted out at all at the same time is highly unlikely. All right. And so the majority of people that, that basically could have, uh, like just in this past election, the majority of incumbents won their reelection. For senators, if you have turnover, a total turnover of 100 there, that might be a little bit more of a problem. All right. So House of Representatives is two year terms, senators are six year terms. Again, a lot of this stuff is just kind of memorization that will be on the Constitution test, which is trying to keep things straight. You guys got this? Can I keep on moving? Try to get it on here. Um, like I said, two of the thirds of all U.S. senators uh, are up for re-election at one time. Uh, if a vacancy occurs, the governor appoints a replacement until the next election or until a special election is held. All right. um, like, for example, um, depending on how stuff plays out here, uh, Senator Harris, uh, she's a senator from uh, California. Um, the governor of California is going to probably appoint a replacement in January. Yes, Gary? Can you go back one slide? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in Illinois, a few years ago, uh, when Barack Obama, in 2008, when Barack Obama won, he was a U.S. senator. Uh, the governor at the time, I don't know if you know if you're heard, you guys are kind of young, guy named Rob Milojevic. Uh, he, um, his job was to kind of appoint a replacement. Apparently, he was on, they had wiretapped his phone, and he was, the thing that got us sent into jail was uh, he was trying to sell, the story was he was trying to basically like kind of sell off the, uh, the uh, vacancy there. Uh, and so you're not supposed to do that. And uh, he was later pardoned by President Trump earlier this year, I think. Uh, so, um, and this is something again that in California they're going to deal with if the, everything plays out. That Senator Harris is going to they're going to have a replacement for her. Qualifications: You got to be 30 years old, all right? So, House of Representatives, you got to be 25. Senate, you got to be 30. You said five years makes a difference. Uh, you have to be a citizen for the United States for at least nine years, and a legal resident of the state that you represent. That's the only qualification. So again, just kind of rote memorization here. Um, I don't remember who's the youngest senator. You know, I think in the late thirties. I can't remember who that is. Um, salary and benefits. All right, there's some perks here. Both senators and representatives receive, as of right now, a salary of one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars a year. Right, it's not bad gig. Uh, you got an allowance here to pay staff members. You have a chief of staff. You have all these various, there's all these people that kind of, you know, kind of work uh, for these guys. Uh, scheduling, all this other stuff. Uh, you receive free trips to home state or district. Uh, particularly for our members of the House of Representatives, is important for them to kind of get back to their kind of constituencies. Uh, as much as they can, because like I said, they're almost constantly up for re-election at this time, right, in this day and age, we, every two years here, right? So you'll find more and more uh, kind of members of the House of Representatives are kind of back home holding like kind of like town hall meetings and stuff like that, more than senators are usually, all right? Um, let's see. Also, too, you have what they call franking privilege. Uh, now, this is, as kind of time goes on, you know, with the kind of everything more done so by, you know, by email and, and such like that. Uh, this may go the way of like the Pony Express to a certain extent, but uh, you have the right to mail official letters and packages for free. Uh, there was a member of the House of Representatives, though, a uh, guy pretty powerful uh, during the during the 1980s and the 90s was, uh, uh, I you had to go to jail for kind of abusing Frank and Crowley. However, you do are given some immunity legal protection when the Congress is in session, right? The whole idea is that they cannot be arrested here um, for certain crimes. I think certain crimes that may be, um, there may be some exemptions there, right? Um, but you're supposed to have a little bit of, little bit of legal protection um, when it comes to certain things. But there's also kind of uh, policies and things that are put in place, rules of conduct that both houses kind of put on uh, members to make sure that they are basically kind of adhering to 
certain rules and such. Um, both houses have the right to decide who should be seated as members. Uh, there's a thing here just recently that um, there's a member who just got somebody just got elected in Georgia. Uh, this lady who um, is kind of a fan of conspiracy theories, and so she's a big advocate for this theory called QAnon. Um, there was some talk of some members leaving within the Republican Party, maybe not having her being seated. Uh, there could be people, so you can be, you can be. There was a, an issue there with a couple of years ago. They had a, a special election. Uh, There's a guy named Roy Moore who was running for Senate in um, Alabama, and he had some kind of like uh, questionable kind of personal behaviors that occurred earlier that was kind of being brought up during the election. There was some talk about if he won, that he wouldn't be seated. Uh, but that rarely, rarely happened, all right? Uh, but they do have the right to do that. Both houses can pass codes of conduct for the member, um, particularly like in certain things, how they behavior, uh, their behavior is like anything from, you know, their own personal behavior to behavior as a kind of a, a, a congressman or a senator. Um, what we here see here is also this kind of, that you can have this idea of being censured, uh, which is a formal disapproval, all right? You're brought in front of Congress, there have been a number of senators and members of the House who have been censured for various things, certain behaviors, personal behaviors, behaviors as congressmen, like abusing certain privileges and that. Um, and then ultimately, the big one is expulsion, being expelled. Uh, they must give up their seat all right, as a result of that. That The last time that happened, I believe, was in 2002 in the House of Representatives. Um, there was this guy. I'm going to give you a chance to give bonus points here. All right. Um, let me show you this dude. Check out that toupee. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. This is the last guy to be expelled from Congress. He's the last. He was, a, he was a congressman from Ohio. If you find out his name and shoot me an email tomorrow, like it just happened to be on your phone or whatever like that, I'll give you three extra points on the test. I like them apples. It's like one free question, one free multiple choice question. Sound good? Check out that toupee though. That's a pretty sweet looking toupee. All right. So on Thursday, we'll talk a little, um, I think I specifically get into more until we talk about like your house of representatives. Um, and then I'm not gonna send you guys out any work tomorrow because tomorrow's Veterans Day, all right? So just look for, uh, don't need to look for anything. We'll uh, resume here with notes on uh, 